The true crime reporter never settles for standing outside the yellow crime scene tape. You knock on doors, dig through records, and cultivate sources to get to the bottom of the story. I'm Robert Riggs, the host and creator of the True Crime Reporter podcast, back with another story from three decades of investigative reporting. In this episode, I pulled out my reporter's notebooks, my law enforcement sources opened up their confidential case files, we sat down together to talk. And you can listen in to our journey into darkness. But before you do, be advised that this podcast is for a mature audience and not for the faint of heart. Some episodes may contain profanity and graphic details of violent crimes. To follow True Crime Reporter, text True Crime to 33777. Text True Crime, that's two words, True Crime to 33777. With that said, here we go on another journey into darkness. Three decades have passed since the McDuff parole scandal rocked Texas. In its wake, the legislature passed a slew of tough-on-crime laws named after McDuff as well as crime victims. Kenneth Allen McDuff is probably one of the nation's most sadistic sexual serial killers that you had never heard of until this podcast. Investigators believe McDuff took an awful secret to his nameless prison cemetery grave the names and locations of the bodies of his other victims, and the names of his other accomplices remain a mystery. The Kenneth McDuff parole scandal brought sweeping changes to the Texas criminal justice system. Newly elected Governor Ann Richards flushed a corrupt good old boys network out of the state's prison and parole systems. Lawmakers passed sweeping reforms dubbed the McDuff Laws. Senator Ted Lyon led the charge. We rewrote the whole penal code in 1992, and it changed that. So all of that came about because of McDuff, Lopez, all those abusive cases, and there were others too. As you may recall from the first episode, it was Lyon who held hearings into the release of death row inmates, including Kenneth McDuff and Leonardo Lopez, who executed three sheriff's deputies in Dallas. Under the McDuff law, a life sentence for capital murder really means life now. Lyon left the Senate in 1993. Today, his law practice focuses on personal injury cases in Mesquite, a suburb of Dallas. Three decades after McDuff's scandalous release and murderous rampage, we sat down together to reflect on the lessons for lawmakers and society. The bottom line is Texas got so much bad press that we were able to convince uh, the next administration. Ann Richards. Ann Richards and Bob Bullock to increase the size of the Texas prison system way beyond what it was then. We put 120,000 new beds into place over several years. And and we had the largest drug treatment system, drug treatment beds in the world at that time. And recidivism, which is the rate of people returning to the prison, dropped dramatically. And the crime rate dropped dramatically. Dramatically. So today, with your perspective on this, what would you say to lawmakers today? I'd say, number one, you need to make sure you have the best drug treatment system in the country because that fuels crime. They don't have that anymore. It was, all those beds were taken away. Uh, That's number one. And number two, for these people that have these violent crimes, that these serial killers, that these multiple murderers, things of that nature, there's no way to rehab those people. You have to keep them in prison as long as you can. Or... uh, if you don't, you're going to subject other family members to losing their loved ones, and it's going to happen on a regular basis. Lyon fears the memory and the lessons of the McDuff parole scandal may have faded. His former experience as a police officer and as chairman of the Senate Criminal Justice Committee 
makes him cautious when he comes to the safety of his family. If I had to t tell single women and women with young children who are alone or whatever, I'd say be very careful. Have a weapon in your home. Have some kind of weapon in your purse that is easy, is easier to get, easy to get to, like mace or something like that. Uh, and be be ready to use it because there are a lot of evil people in the world, and they're out there still, and they're running. I mean, I, I have grandchildren. I have daughter-in-laws. I have a granddaughter that's 15, and I worry about them all the time. I really do because I know what's out there. I know. Arnell McNamara, the Western-style lawman who hunted McDuff, retired from the U.S. Marshal Service after serving 33 years. McLennan County, Texas voters elected McNamara their sheriff in 2012 and returned him to office in 2016. At the time of our conversation in his Waco office in 2020, the 72-year-old sheriff was running for a third term with a new campaign slogan, Riding Herd on the Lawless. With all of your experience in law enforcement and what you saw in this case, for women who are listening to this, what what advice do you have to uh, to them about not putting themselves in the path of a predator like McDuff or what to do if you do come across? First of all, don't knowingly put yourself in harm's way. Uh, stay out of bad places. One of the main things is be aware of your surroundings. If something doesn't look right, it's probably not. Play it safe. If you're somewhere where you believe somebody is watching you, like a mall or something, don't walk to your car if there's people out there around your car in the dark. Go back in the mall. Get, get security. Be aware of your surroundings. Don't take an unnecessary chance. Also, I'm a firm believer in the Second Amendment. Everyone has a right to protect themselves. I think every woman should have a firearm of some kind to protect her or at least pepper spray some type of weapon that they can use uh, in dire straits if somebody does try to kidnap them or harm them in any way. You know, one of my frustrations being on television is that I was – because it's a uh, – an audience with children in it, and there are broadcast standards, we really couldn't ever tell the public just how heinous and evil, the, the details. And what McDuff did, and others like him do, is really unimaginable to people. And so people have a certain innocence about this, and so they don't know how bad it is, and they don't, even, they don't believe something bad can happen to them. Absolutely. Most of the time, the public sees this in black and white. They see it in the newspaper. They get the Cliff Notes edition of what happened, which is always very sketchy. They don't get the down and dirty, nitty gritty. They don't get it in full color, usually blood red. And so what they get is not the way it really was. And not until you stand in a field with some scumbag like Hank Worley telling you details about how they inflicted pain on an innocent person uh, do you really get the full story and the full picture. Arnell McNamara's childhood friend, Larry Pamplin, retired after serving 20 years as the Falls County Sheriff. To this day, 30 years later, Pamplin believes McDuff kidnapped dozens of women with help from other accomplices who have never been caught. Based on what you know of him, you suspect there's other accomplices out there that were never caught because he always needed to have a partner to show off to. Absolutely. Absolutely. He always liked to have an individual with a a strong back and a weak mind and Melissa Northrop case is a prime example. Uh, there was never found to be a, an accomplice involved in that and I will die believing that there was an accomplice there. How about in terms of more victims, 
that we don't know about. Oh, I, I, I wouldn't venture to to really guess, but I, I think it would just make you cry if you, you really knew how many people he had actually killed. Tim Steglich agrees with Pamplin's assessment. You may recall from earlier episodes that Steglich extracted the confession from McDuff's accomplice in the Colleen Reed murder case. He retired as a criminal investigator for the Bell County Sheriff's Department in 2013. At the time of this podcast, Steglich works for the Travis County District Attorney. Steglich believes McDuff left a trail of victims and used other accomplices who got away with murder. And you believe there's a lot of other bodies out there? I do. Victims of McDuff? I do. What is it about the case that makes you think that? All of the officers think that. And they're, they're, some of the officers think that there were other accomplices we don't know about. That's that's likely. That's likely. He uh, he was so good at disposing of the bodies. He, he went through a lot of trouble. Uh, most uh, serial killers aren't going to dig a grave. Uh, he did not want the bodies found. Some serial killers do. He didn't want any notoriety. This is what he did for fun. And he didn't want to get caught. Dan Stoltz, who led the nationwide manhunt for Kenneth McDuff, retired from the U.S. Marshal Service and became a Texas rancher. He, too, believes McDuff took secrets to his unmarked prison grave. So, everybody I've interviewed believe that there are more victims, more women buried out there that we don't know about. And they think there are a lot. And they also think there are accomplices from other murders. I believe so. I believe... I believe that he was laughing at us when we put him to death, saying, I'm taking my secrets with me. I believe so. Yes, there's no doubt about it that there's other victims out there. What is, what, from your experience, what is that gut feeling that tells you? My that? gut feeling that there's other victims just by the, by the way he acted. First, he's going to show us the bodies, then he wasn't going to show us the bodies. He was still trying to be in control. And and my gut feeling and his mannerism was the time that he the, the, at the right at the end where he says let make let me free, release me release me there it was like he he's was, in control like he was in control so he took he took his secrets with him yeah so well he seems so prolific you have to think there and um, had you ever seen one that could just hide the bodies the way he did with burying in remote places. No, 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 and that shows me that he has a lot of a lot, had a lot of experience in doing so, which makes me believe that there was more bodies out there, because he was able to put those bodies in such remote places without any care. Even the way he did it, some of them how he, like if he was deer hunting. So. In earlier episodes, you heard from U.S. Attorney Bill Johnston. Johnston played a pivotal role to launch the McDuff manhunt, help find the bodies of three of McDuff's victims before his execution, and prosecuted the parole board chairman who released McDuff. Johnston left the federal prosecutor's office and opened a private law practice. What do you say for the future? What do you say that it, 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 that we should always be on the lookout for. We should never um, forget what happened. And thank goodness you're informing people. I doubt that, oh, one in 30 or 40 or 50 Texans right now would even remember or have a, uh, would yeah. have the gravity of what happened. So most people have already forgotten. But it's important to know what happened because it can absolutely repeat itself. And what you look for is, you look for um, people who shouldn't be out of prison committing crimes. That's as simple as it is. You look for people that should be in prison committing crimes. After they McDuff, all those McDuff laws were passed and people uh, had to serve a larger portion of their sentence, everything really tightened down. You know, they had this enormous, as you know, enormous prison construction where the prisons, every other town in Texas has got a prison with it now. Uh, that wasn't the case. It was almost exclusively in Huntsville in the old days. Uh, so anyhow, um, 
so for the for many years after that, uh, people served a high percentage of their sentences, even for less than terrible crimes, and people um, for violent crimes served, you know, three fourths or more of the sentence, or they're still there. But I can tell you that now you do see people serving um, an eighth of their sentence, a tenth of their sentence. And I'm not talking about violent people with the uh, special findings, but it may be the first layer of erosion is what's happening now that you have people who a jury may say you should do 20 years for, let's say a drug crime. And after a year and a half or two years, they're out. And that's not what the jury intended. And that's not what people think is happening. Um, perhaps that's where the erosion begins and then when people's memories are more faint, we'll start letting the violent people out. But all you, again, all you need to look for, it's uh, it's supposedly what's, it's supposedly one of the problems with Chicago. I don't know that to be the case. But supposedly one of the problems in Chicago is that they have a, a very open bail bond system. So someone's arrested for a terrible crime and they're allowed bail. And then... People who go to prison don't stay long. And so you have multi-time convicted people committing terrible crimes. That's what you look for. And that you know the system's either corrupt or broken in some fashion. Based on the underbelly of Central Texas where this investigation took you and what you learned of McDuff, what do you say to, particularly to women that are out alone with their children at a shopping mall or at a convenience store filling up with gas or late at a... What is a woman to do? You hate to think about this. Um, someone asked me about an area of Mexico recently, and they said, is it safe to go there? And I said, it's perfectly safe until you're kidnapped or murdered. And then it's not. So it's really not fun for people to think, gosh, I can go out to a, you know, the bars in Dallas until one in the morning, nothing's going to happen to me. And they get home and they're perfectly safe. That was perfectly safe what they just did. The problem is that there are some people out there. I hope there's not an exact McDuff, but there are people out there that have such a disregard for life that you almost need to you don't want to be in fear, but you want to be prepared because, you know, the rabbit in the field doesn't know there's a hawk diving on him. It just dives on him and bang, it has him. And there's nothing you can do. During the previous episodes, you heard a lot about undercover prison investigator John Moriarty, the tough-talking Irish cop from New York City. Moriarty provided intelligence to hunt down McDuff, he tricked McDuff into drawing a map of where he buried the body of Colleen Reed. He got some basic confessions from McDuff. He worked on the U.S. Attorney's grand jury investigation of the parole board chairman who released McDuff. And finally, he witnessed McDuff's execution. After Governor Ann Richards cleaned house, Moriarty rose in the ranks to become the Inspector General of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. And Moriarty graduated from the FBI's National Academy. On the occasion of Moriarty's retirement in 2011, a newspaper profile said, quote, His job description reads like a script from a cop reality show. Witness executions to make sure the state's procedures are followed. Supervise the capture of escapees. Bust lawmakers for new crimes committed inside the gritty world of prisons. At the time of this podcast, Moriarty works as a criminal justice consultant. He specializes in investigating cases in which an inmate dies in custody. Moriarty understood the mind of Kenneth McDuff, as well as violent psychopaths like him, better than anyone on this case. Is there a lesson out of the McDuff case that we should not forget? Well, uh, the bottom line is that, in my opinion, uh, the people that make decisions on who gets released shouldn't be political appointments. That's the bottom line. It should be professionals that, you know, understand convicts and, and understand 
uh, 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 psychopaths and 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 can't be compromised. Pay them well enough to make those decisions. But um, uh, you know, when you're, I had a, had had another parole board chairman uh, tell me. And, and it's, uh, I, I believe the best analysis of the parole system is that 20% should never get out, 20% of them. 20% will get out just after serving their little bit of time. It's that 60% in the middle that we got the problem with. And um, making an educated decision, not a political decision, on uh, – you know, is is the only thing that's saving saving the uh, the public. Finally, let's wrap up with Parnell McNamara, the lawman whose family members have spent more than a century bringing fugitives to justice for the U.S. Marshal Service. By the time their investigation was over, everyone on the case felt a personal attachment to the families of the victims, especially Colleen Reed and Melissa Norther. In closing, I asked McNamara how the loss affected their families. And what did you see it did to his families, the, the family's victims? You got to know all of them pretty well. I did. And, you know, after all that happened and was finally over, and it's not ever over, but I would talk to Colleen's uh, parents. They lived in Louisiana. I'd call them on Christmas and different holidays just to touch base with them and let them know we didn't forget about them. Uh, they were brokenhearted. Uh, Lori Bible, uh, Colleen's sister, just absolutely was devastated, and she was so courageous during that whole thing. Mm-hmm. And we just loved Lori, uh, and were able to talk to her again uh, this summer on a, on another thing. And I hadn't seen Lori in years and years, but uh, we got to. Uh, be very good friends with the Solomons who were uh, uh, Melissa Northrop's parents and uh, it's uh, I don't know you just feel a closeness because you're all fighting for the same thing and that's justice and to put this guy away forever and uh, I'll tell you this that was was very very moving for me Uh, my wife and I gave the conceal handgun class for about eight years and I would always use the McDuff case as a warning that you don't have to be in the wrong part of town you don't have to be out at midnight you don't have to be drunk in a bar you can be in your own house you can be washing your car you can be working at a at at your job and be carried off in the dark by some of these these predators and so I'd always tell the McDuff case is is one of several so I'm in the class, we've got like 50 people in there, and this young girl walks in, uh, in her 20s, and she's got two little kids with her, and they're about four or five years old. And so I tell her, I said, come on in, ma'am, and I just finished the McDuff story. And I said, can I help you? Because I didn't know if she wanted to sit in on the class or what, and she said, she came up to the front, and she said, I just want to thank you and all the officers that worked so hard to bring Kenneth Macduff to justice because he killed my mother, Melissa Northrop. And there was not a dry eye in that class. And I said, oh my God, I said, I am so sorry. Um, I don't know what to say. I was speechless and I said, I have not seen you since you were the age of those little children right there. And she said, well, I just wanted you to know I heard you were given the class and I wanted to come by and thank you for doing that. And uh, I'm telling you, I had tears rolling down my face and everybody in there did. You could hear a pin drop when she said, he killed my mother. In closing, we honor the memory of Deputy U.S. Marshal Mike McNamara, Parnell McNamara's brother, and Inspector U.S. Marshal Mike Carnavale, Dan Stoltz's partner. First, a few words from Sheriff McNamara about his late brother, Mike. 
Mike was my partner in law enforcement mm-hmm. the whole time. He and I hired on with U.S. Marshals in 1970 the same day. And so Mike was right there by my side every step of the way. I never had to wonder where Mike was. And uh, Mike was also my partner in life. Uh, we went to school together, grew up together, drove the same cars. And so uh, I totally trusted Mike mm-hmm. uh, to have my back. He was always there. Dan Stoltz remembers the dedication of his late partner, Inspector U.S. Marshal Mike Carnavali. They had each other's backs while chasing fugitives around the world. Carnavali suffered from terminal cancer during the Macduff manhunt. Stoltz says Marshal Carnavali refused to stop until he slapped the handcuffs on the serial killer, Kenneth Allen Macduff. Yeah, and and, uh, and, uh, there was times that we had to tell him sleep in the back of the car or go back to the hotel room. Look, Mike and I was pretty close. I mean, I'd see the two of you everywhere together. Yeah, we're 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 very close. Uh, his 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 cancer didn't stop him, and I didn't want to be the one to say, "Look, Mike, you're sick. Go back to you. Go back to your district." Whatever Mike needed, I would have done it, uh, and and he wanted to stay working, and I think that was the best medicine that he could have had. Aren't you glad it's not a crime to love reality TV? Hey, true crime lovers, this is Shannon, one of the researchers for this podcast. Paper Chaser Paper Goods is your go-to spot for all of your reality TV obsessions. Check out paperchaserpaper.com and channel your love of the Real Housewives with Paper Chaser's reality TV-themed gifts. From cocktail napkins to Bravo TV-themed invitations, Paper Chaser has everything you need to host happy hour at your place and be the it girl of your inner circle. Now remember, it's not a crime to love reality TV. Paper Chaser believes life's a party, so celebrate something every day. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram for the latest Paper Chaser in reality TV scoop. We'll see you on paperchaserpaper.com. True Crime Reporter is a trademarked and copyrighted news show. It is an original co-production with podcast ad reps. Hosted and written by me, Robert Riggs. Executive producer, Elizabeth Arnold. Audio production by Matt Stoker. Original music by Blair King. Associate producer, Siler Burr. Social media producer, Grace Woodward. Publicity, Tim Livingston, PR. Photography, Igor Kurgulots. Graphics, Brian David Kerr Designs. Special thanks to Gary Laverne, author of Bad Boy from Rosebud, The Murderous Life of Kenneth Allen McDuff. The audio recordings of the Senate Criminal Justice Committee hearings are courtesy of the Texas State Archives. Archive sound bites included in the episodes are from my original Reporter's Notebook tape recordings.